This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast have probably read or at least know about the book Millionaire Teacher by Andrew Hellam. I've had lots of clients over the years ask me about it. And it's kind of the go-to, you know, learning about investing, index investing, specific to Canada book. So anyway, we were fortunate enough to have Andrew come on the podcast and he kind of, he told us a story afterwards of how he got connected. He connected with me on LinkedIn and told me the story of how some, it was a, I hope I get this right, a Chinese guy living in Australia that moderates a personal finance Facebook group that Andrew is somehow associated with. I don't know if he's a member. In Dubai, I think. In UAE, yeah. Yeah. So that guy kept sending Andrew my stuff, like blog posts and videos. And eventually Andrew connected. Anyway, he connected and I was like, hey, you should come on our podcast. Yeah, he was great. We reached him in Victoria. He's here briefly in between Costa Rica and Ukraine. He's an expat, not a Canadian, well, not a Canadian resident, I guess he's a Canadian citizen, gone expat, speaks all over the world. How many talks did he say he did in a year? He did 90 talks. I think he said in six months back that is in 2007, 2008. Wild. Yeah, really interesting guy. Hey, he left Canada to teach in uh, Singapore as a, as a personal I, finance teacher. Yeah, I think that developed eventually. I don't know if that's what he started, but he's taught in private schools forever. But he just talks about how as a private school teacher, he had to, well, if you read the book, he says all this, but he had to build his own pension. So he got really into saving and investing and index investing and all that stuff. And eventually he wrote in 2011, Millionaire Teacher. He'd been writing beforehand in Money Sense and other publications. And then he wrote a second book, Millionaire Expat. I think they're both in their second edition now. And the next bad came from the experiences he had watching expats get pitched horrible products around the world. But he's, his knowledge base, you know, I, I think a lot of personal finance writers will have pretty good general knowledge of investing and indexing and all that kind of stuff. I think Andrew's up one level from that, where he's got really good knowledge of factor investing and small cap and value and the evidence. Even in his book, Millionaire Teacher, at the end, he talks about how the small cap, the pure small cap premium went away after the delisting bias was corrected in Shumway's paper. And I read that and I was like, okay, Andrew's doing his homework. He also talked about the correlation between debt and misery, which I thought was interesting given some of the guests and discussions we've had lately on the podcast. On leverage, yeah. Yep. yeah. And then to me, the takeaway of the day was, the term of the day was geographical arbitrage. Yeah, we talked at the end briefly about the idea of living, working in Canada, saving in Canada, but retiring somewhere else. To a cheaper destination. Yeah, and he's done that, obviously. So it was interesting to hear his firsthand view on what that's like, because I don't think as Canadians, we generally think about retiring that way. Anything else to add? No, let's go to our conversation with Andrew. Episode 99 with Andrew Hallam. Andrew Hallam, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. We are very excited to have you here. Thanks for the invitation. So to start, can you explain to us and our listeners how you define wealth? Well, if we're looking at financial wealth, I'm assuming, yeah. Obviously, you know, wealth and health is really wealth and relationships and such. But when we're talking about financial wealth. I set what I figured to me seemed like a, a reasonable sort of benchmark or bar with respect to wealth, because what I would often see is people that would make X amount of money were often considered wealthy. And I thought how crazy that was. I'd see articles in Forbes magazine or Fortune magazine, and they'd be talking about people that earned, you know, above certain threshold being wealthy. And I thought, well, that was fascinating because I've met a lot of people who make one in particular that I'm thinking of right now, a guy who makes, after taxes, he makes about $8 million a year. And it sounds quite extraordinary because he lives in an income tax free jurisdiction and he makes an absolute fortune, but he's not wealthy. He's poor. And so the reason I say he's poor is that if his salary completely dried up, he has enough savings to live for about a month. So he looks like he's wealthy and he's an extreme case, but he is representative of so many people that we see around us on a daily basis. Your neighbor who might drive that brand new Tesla who lives in that really big house, who you know might earn 
five or six hundred thousand dollars a year. But unless that person can survive, actually thrive without an income, that person isn't wealthy at all. So I know when I wrote Millionaire Teacher, I said something like this. I said, all right, let's assume that in Canada, the median household income is, let's just say it's $70,000 a year. So my definition of wealthy in that respect would be someone that could end up spending double that, so $140,000 a year, indexed to inflation for the rest of their lives and never work for it. So that was my definition. I'd be kind of curious to hear what your definition is. I know you guys are asking the questions, but how do you guys define it? I completely agree with when I read that or reread, I read it for the second time, that section of your book. I just think it's such a perfect definition. People, like you said, with cash flow are not necessarily wealthy if they're spending all of it and don't have savings. I guess the tricky part in defining wealth is what the discount rate that you use is to determine the number that you're just talking about. Like how much would you need to have to be able to sustain two times the median household income? To use the 4% rule, to use the 2% rule? Anyway, that's a pretty nuanced discussion for another time maybe. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And I link it back to happiness because a lot of people just want to make more to buy more stuff, which means you need more wealth to continue to be able to have that stuff. And some few people take the time to link it back to their own happiness. So I have a question for you about that perspective and how do you coach people to get perspective around how much is enough and where is that level of happiness? It's a really good question that you're asking because I think that many people will pursue certain things believing that it will make them happier, like a new car or a bigger house. But when we look at happiness studies, and this is what I love, that there are people in universities that study happiness full-time. And it's really cool to look at what is it that they're actually finding. And what they've found is that, say, a car. You buy a brand new car. You buy a brand new car, and for a moment, it's like a sugar fix. You feel really good about it. You feel happy about it. Or a brand new phone. You're jazzed, you've got the greatest, latest iPhone 11 or iPhone 55 or whatever it may happen to be. But after a really short period of time, it becomes just another phone. It becomes just another car. So Michigan State University did a really cool study on people with vehicles, different types of vehicles to see, all right, were people that were driving BMWs any happier or did they enjoy their driving experience anymore? And as great studies do, they asked all kinds of questions. So people didn't really know what it was they were looking for. But at the end, they found that there's much like a hedonic treadmill. There's a quick sugar fix, but generally the actual driving experience for somebody with a seven series BMW is really no better in terms of how they feel about it and how happy it makes them versus somebody who drives a 10-year-old Honda Civic. So it's much the same for material items, but for experiences, this is where money can actually help you. If you are spending money on something that will augment an experience, so it might be a trip that you're taking with your family or with your loved ones, so you can spend time together building memories. These are the things that actually build people's levels of happiness. So now when it comes back to part of that original question, is, all right, we have an income. We want to save it for the future. Here are certain things that we know statistically, based on studies, don't increase levels of happiness. And they're often these material things. And what happens then is, too, we're often buying, most of the people that are buying a brand new car today are borrowing money to do it. And so one thing we do know is that there is a direct correlation between debt and misery. So you've worked to purchase something that won't augment your lifestyle, and in doing so, you've undercut your level of happiness by going further into debt. So it's this sort of broad perspective that I try to give people when they're trying to figure out how to live for today while also living for tomorrow. So if you can cut back on a lot of those material things that won't augment your levels of happiness, you can use that money to invest for your future, to buy yourself financial independence at an earlier time, which will allow you potentially to spend more time with people that you love. That of course makes a ton of sense. I think one of the challenges 
practically that people have is that their neighbor just bought a new car and they maybe feel embarrassed about their old Toyota that they have in, in the driveway. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you think people should approach that issue of wanting to live frugally, but having to deal with the fact that probably a lot of the people around them are spending and maybe even spending not their own money going into debt? It's an awesome question and probably an unanswerable one. But the one thing that, you know, talking to my wife and she would look at people with better things than what we had. And she's actually rewired a lot of her thinking in that respect too, because one, she's also, I've shared with her the happiness studies. Two, I've also shared with her the studies on, all right, what is it that rich people, what's the most common type of car for rich people? What do they typically buy? And most people that drive Maseratis and Porsches and BMWs, many of them are rich, but most of them are not. They're just people with big salaries and big debts and debt equals misery. So when my wife sees somebody now driving a Ferrari, she often wonders how long is it going to take them to pay for it? And what's the depreciation rate of that thing? So how much is that person losing on a month to month basis just by owning it in terms of depreciation? So I think, yeah, the psychological aspect here, Ben, is a really tough one for people to get their heads around. And that's something that only they can really struggle with and conquer on their own. But I think too, helping them understand that broader perspective can help them to conquer that keeping up with the Joneses type concept. You mentioned your wife rewiring her thinking. And I think one of the things that we often see is one spouse in a relationship gets really bought into this idea of being frugal and saving for financial independence while they're, the other spouse is not as bought in. How have you guys navigated that? <laughs> it's funny. She probably really won't mind me answering it this way. But when we first got married, I remember asking her, so like, where's all your money? Where is it? And she didn't have debts and she did have some savings, but she'd earned more money in terms of her income than I had earned over my working lifetime significantly, but she had significantly less. And what she ended up doing, I think it was in part probably through helping me with it. Obviously, she would listen to me you know, jabber on about investing in behavioral economics and wants versus needs. I didn't actually lecture her. And that was the nice thing. I think she came from a foundation of frugality where her family was somewhat frugal as well. And so for her, it wasn't that much of a transition. Today, ironically, she's the frugal one. I'm the one who's saying, hey, you know, I want that basket of organic blueberries and I don't care how much it costs. And she's the one putting the brakes on a lot of things. So it's kind of come full circle where now I'm really wanting to relax a little bit. And her New Year's resolution for the past two years in a row has actually been to spend more money. And she's well, failing. She's <laughs> I'm lucky I don't have a spendthrift wife for sure. Right. So Andrew, I'd like to go back to your comment about there's a correlation between debt and misery. Over the past few podcasts, we talked about the benefits of borrowing, especially in a low interest rate environment, to invest, the ability to grow the assets, and then uh, have a low cost of borrowing. How do you square those two sides of the equation? Well, I guess how easily manageable is it? And if the interest rate rises, let's say the interest rate doubles, could you still really handle that? If we're looking at credit card debt and consumer debt, we're looking at interest rates of 18% per year. And I often ask that question, double it. Can you emotionally handle paying 36% a year on a depreciating asset? Well, that's insanity. When it comes to something like an asset that can appreciate, we're looking at a different story now. So we're looking at, let's say it's a home or let's say it's a rental property. Yeah, over time, that's going to create income for you. It's going to also create some kind of capital gain, potentially, if you do choose to sell it. But interest rates right now are historically low. So if you're borrowing, and I come back to that acid test, and it's just super simple. I mean, it's something my mom's not an economist, but it's just something my mom drove into me when I was really young. And she said to me, Andrew, if you're going to borrow to do anything, borrow to buy a house, borrow to do anything, could you handle it? if the interest rate doubled. And so for me, that's my asset test. And I don't know, where do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think about the other side, which is, can you handle it if the market dives? And let's say your stock portfolio is down 30 or 40% and you still have that full liability on the books. 
I could see that causing a lot of stress, but you don't really know until you live through that how you're going to react. Because the hard part is there's always a story that happens at the time that the markets go down, be it the coronavirus, be it 9-11. Yeah, always, always. And it always feels like this crisis is different. So I was just curious on your perspectives on that part. Yeah, and I'm a pretty wimpy investor. So like for me, I, I wouldn't personally borrow money to invest in equities, but that doesn't mean that's right nor wrong. That's really up to somebody's level of tolerance for risk. So it wouldn't suit me, but I'm not saying that it shouldn't suit anyone. I think that's like when Cameron said, we've discussed the benefits of leverage on the podcast. That's true. But I think I would qualify that by saying that we've discussed the statistical benefits, but we've also been, I think, pretty open about discussing why most people probably wouldn't want to do that. But it, your comment about the correlation between debt and misery in the context of boring to invest, I just find that interesting. I mean, it relates to what Cameron was saying about living through a downturn while you also have the debt. Yeah, I think it's just, it's so, for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, not owing any money leads to a really nice, solid night's sleep. Right. One of the things that we've observed in practice is people who pay off their mortgages and tell us that they're thinking about borrowing back against the house to invest because they know it's a statistically smart thing to do. We always say, okay, well, let's get the mortgage paid off and then we'll make the decision about reborrowing afterwards. And not once has someone come back and said, all right, I'm ready to have a mortgage again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. So what do you guys recommend for people when they come to the question of, I mean, do we see the long term statistically? Yeah. If you're looking at a diversified portfolio of index funds, you're looking at longer term returns there than you really would be paying in terms of the interest on a loan. Where do you guys stand with that when you have a client that comes to you and says, I'm interested in doing something like this? Well, we've kind of, I wouldn't say shot ourselves in the foot, but we've put ourselves in this position where because we have talked about this in the podcast and a lot of our clients listen to it, we've been getting a lot of questions about leverage. And as of now, nobody's implemented it. I think we're approaching it extremely cautiously. I'm actually in the process right now of modeling using three different simulation techniques. I'm doing a Monte Carlo simulation, a bootstrap using historical US data, and a rolling historical period just to give people context for the potential outcomes of using leverage versus not. That's maybe one of the ways that will help people frame the decision. Like, look, you could actually end up much worse off by doing this as opposed to just you know, investing like you would have otherwise. Yeah. So I would say we're approaching it very cautiously, but with a view of this being a statistically good decision. Yeah. I think that's really good because you then have people, once they're informed, they're able to really make that rational decision and an educated decision on their own with their personal money. And then they can ask themselves, if then does it reflect their tolerance for risk? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's actually been an interesting exercise because you look at the Monte Carlo, which is I think how most people would think about looking at the potential range of outcomes. Leverage looks amazing. But as soon as you factor in the skewness and the fat tails of the real distribution of stock returns using bootstrap, all of a sudden it looks terrifying. And there's, yeah, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's negative outcomes and stuff. So yeah, anyway. Cautiously is how Which is realistic. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. (laughs) So the audience of this podcast, I would say is, I don't know, an intermediate level investor on average. I don't think we're a beginner level personal finance podcast. And so they're generally bought into the idea of index funds, at least conceptually, although there are probably still people listening that have actively managed funds in their portfolio. But I don't think that the message of why index funds makes sense can be repeated enough. And you did such a good job explaining it in your book. So can you just explain why indexing is a good idea? Well, as I like to look at William F. Sharp's published piece in a Stanford-based published piece called The Arithmetic of Active Management. And what it, of course, indicates is that if the market moves up, let's say 10% in a given year, then the typical actively managed fund before all fees would have returned about 10% per year because we represent the market. All of us represent it. So all the index fund investors, all of the actively managed fund investors. So on aggregate, we know that if the market moves up 10 before all fees, that's what the typical active manager would have moved or earned in stocks that year. So 
if say the US market went up 10. So anyway, so right now you're looking at, okay, well, your odds of beating the index are 50%. You're right in the middle, right? So you're going to get 10% is the market return and 10% was the aggregate return of professional fund managers before fees. Then we know that, well, let's just say roughly, it's not statistically exactly like this, but roughly uh, half of the money would have beaten the market and half of the money would have underperformed the market. Then we added investment fees then we look at things like survivorship bias, and we end up getting up to a point where over a 10-year period or longer, you're going to get 85 to 90% of active fund managers after fees underperforming a risk-adjusted equivalent portfolio of index funds, low-cost index funds. The, the interesting thing is, of course, so many people will say, well, here's a fund that has actually outperformed the market over the last five years or the last 10 years, so I'm going to be investing in that. And I like looking at Spiva's persistence scorecard, where you'll look at funds that have outperformed during one time period, rarely outperform during another. You can take an example, too, of, I mean, it's wonderful marketing, but you have the firm American Funds in the U.S., and it's a great actively managed fund company. Fees are quite low. And they're touting that, hey, you don't think you can beat an index? Well, we have beaten the index. Well, they've been around a really long time. And what they did was they started off with, they really understand early on, like Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham did, Bill Juan did. They understood early on that if they could tilt towards a value factor, cheaper stocks. Cheaper stocks typically ended up outperforming the market. So in the early days, they ended up getting this really nice advantage. Well, now so many people understand that long-term value in small cap will outperform a general market cap based index. So now we understand that. But back in the day, we didn't. So when you look at those long term charts of how American funds have done relative to the index, and you start to say, hey, let's look at the last 15 years, it's a completely different story because it's become more and more competitive. It's become tougher and tougher for an active manager to actually beat the market because we know so much about these factors that historically have outperformed. So that's my explanation whether it makes sense or not. No, no, it's a good explanation. And our listeners, I think, again, on average, will definitely hear the message about factors because that's something that we talk about quite a bit. You've also written a fair amount about advisors you've come across. Can you talk about some of the things that financial advisors say to keep people away from index funds? They'll do all kinds of things to, I'll tell you what they would do right now. So if we were going to be looking at a financial advisor, you just met them. So Often, they'll say something like this, hey, look, here's one of our model portfolios, and here are the returns from the last six months of the S&P 500 index. Well, we've trounced them. So one of the things that they'll do is they'll say, we can protect you during market drops. And what they'll do in that respect, and I saw this, and I'm, see, I'm sure you guys have seen this a lot, is they won't compare apples to apples. When it's convenient for them, they'll compare apples to oranges. So they'll say something like, okay, here's our actively managed portfolio. And it might include bonds, US stocks, Canadian stocks. So it's got a whole mishmash within it. And they'll compare it very conveniently to a US stock market index after the index itself has had a drop. And the whole point here is that investors, smart investors, don't build portfolios with a single index fund. They diversify across various asset classes. So a lot of these people, that's one of the strategies is they'll say, we can end up beating the index. Here's an example of it. Or they'll say index funds are dangerous because your money will fall prolifically when the market falls. Or they'll say, look, we've found these actively managed funds that have beaten the index. These are the funds that will get you in today. They're hoping that their investors don't understand the reversion to the mean concept, whereby a fund that wins during one time period is typically not going to be the fund that wins during the next time period. So a variety of tricks that these people will use, some of them will say, well, Warren Buffett has beaten the index, so we can too. And unless you're actually looking at Warren Buffett when you're staring at the face of your financial advisor, one, that isn't likely to happen. Two, even Warren Buffett knows it, so he's instructed that his estate, on behalf of his wife, when he passes on, is going to be invested in a portfolio of low-cost indexes. 
And we know full well that this guy has access to money managers that we don't have access to, but he knows statistically his wife's money will outperform about 90% of them with the index portfolio. Not to mention that Buffett's gone over a decade trailing the S&P 500 index. Not that that matters. <laughs> he, he might come back, but <laughs> it's, it's as a, of today. It gets tougher and tougher to beat the market, doesn't it? Yeah. So when we're recording this, and the episode will be released in the future, so who knows what will be happening then. But as of the day that we're recording, the US market's down like almost 8% in US dollar terms for one trading day, which is kind of crazy. And like we were just talking about, or you were talking about with index funds dropping with the market, maybe you have some bonds in your portfolio to temper that. But what do you think index investors should, how do you think an index investors should approach market volatility so that they can stay in their seats and maybe not worry too much? I think that they need to recognize that if they're purchasers, if they're actually adding money to the markets, so they're at least five years away from retirement, they're adding their money. When the market drops and they're dollar cost averaging, so they're adding the same amount of money every month, it allows them to buy a greater number of units. Volatility can be actually kind of cool because if you take a period of 10 years where markets are really volatile and you take the historical returns of a fund during a given volatile time period, and let's say the investment fund ended up averaging, I don't know, 7% per year, somebody who actually dollar cost averaged into that fund was able to buy fewer units when the fund price rose and a greater number of units when the fund price dropped. So in essence, their time-weighted or money-weighted return can actually end up being higher than the fund's return itself just through that process of closing their eyes, putting the money on autopilot, and buying every single month. That isn't always the case, obviously, like when the markets are continuing to rise. There isn't necessarily that lovely advantage, but during volatile periods, I think it's really great. Yeah. There's a quote in your book from uh, William Bernstein, I think that was something along the lines of young investors should get down on their knees and pray for a long extended bear market. I still do. I mean, I'm 49 and I still have an income and I really enjoy seeing market crashes. And I know that I should be sensitive to how other people feel about them. But I do know that if somebody is adding money to the markets and they're actually upset to see the same thing they're buying be reduced in price, if that actually upsets them, then they don't have the correct perspective on what it really means to be a long-term investor. What do you think about the role of gold in a long-term portfolio? Uh, so it depends, doesn't it? It's one of those things that obviously, okay, long-term, gold doesn't make any money. I mean, people really think it does. If you bought yourself $1,000 worth of gold in 1801 and you sold it today, you'd make you basically keep pace with inflation. Gold long-term is not a big money maker. So that's one thing. I think in my book, I looked at what $1 worth of gold would have got you if you invested in 1801. And I figured that today you could, if you sold those proceeds today, you could just maybe fill the gas tank of your minivan. Whereas if you put that $1 in US stocks, or if you earn the return of the US stock market, in 1801, you really would be looking at something in excess of $10 million. So as a asset class, it doesn't make money long term. However, there are examples where gold moves up and down a lot. And so it's often one of those things, it's a bit like a mattress. You know, when people lose money in the stock market or when the stock market drops, I shouldn't say when they lose money because you only lose when you've sold. But after the stock market drops, many people will sell stocks and stuff money into mattresses and things like gold. They really shouldn't, but gold often moves inversely to riskier asset classes. Often when riskier asset classes rise, gold dips a little bit. So one of the interesting things that Harry Brown, when he created the permanent portfolio, he looked at taking a portfolio where you buy, you have the stock market exposure, cash, short-term bonds, or long, sorry, long-term bonds and gold and rebalancing that, roughly rebalancing that once a year. So a quarter in gold, a quarter in long-term bonds, a quarter in equities, and then a quarter in cash, or more pragmatically, uh, say a short-term bond market index. And yeah, it reduces volatility. 
it does reduce volatility, but long term it won't enhance returns. When you're looking at all of the back tests and you go through rolling 10 year periods, it's just another portfolio. So, okay, it might be more or less volatile, but again, it doesn't have a history of outperforming something really simple like 60% equities and 40% bonds. So, if for some people it helps to color their inner nerves, and I've seen some financial advisors who have said, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to follow this model just to keep you calm. I can see that as a benefit for some, but it doesn't necessarily augment the long-term returns to the investor. Where, where are you guys at on that? Well, I was curious to ask you, you mentioned 60-40. Are you suggesting 60-40 isn't dead? Um, I don't think so because, you know, funny thing about people when they talk about, say, 60-40 portfolio is dead, they'll say, well, bond interest rates are really low right now. And the two key words that they're talking about are, right now. What they're implying is that the right now means the future and nobody can see the future. And so that's the thing we have to be so, so careful about. And even when you're looking at something like uh, looking at sustainable withdrawal rates and people saying, well, you know what, ah, maybe three and a half percent inflation adjusted withdrawal rate won't work in the future because bond interest rates are low right now. And the right now component fixating on that, I think probably two of the most dangerous words that investors could use. Yeah. Our view on gold is uh, similar to yours, maybe a little bit more aggressive, but maybe you were holding back because you didn't know our view. I don't know. <laughs> we don't think it belongs in portfolios, but uh, we, we've talked about that on the podcast and I've done a YouTube video on it. And it's one of those things where people are extremely passionate both for and against, which I find interesting. You mentioned the data on gold going back to the 1800s. If you look further back between the 15th and 17th century, there was a period referred to as the price revolution where there was massive inflation in terms of gold, I guess, for 150 years and gold just got decimated in terms of its its value. So I think for the data that it's easy for us to look at, it's been a, an okay inflation hedge. But if you go back further, it ha that has not always been true. You know what's funny too about gold is people that do end up liking it, thinking it's really good. Like any other asset class, they get into it at the worst possible time. Why does it become popular in 2009? You know, that's the crazy thing. I mean, you're looking at, I remember looking at financial magazines and the headlines would be protect your money now and there'd be a padlock there with your, your money inside it. And they're telling people to buy bonds and to buy gold. And it's smart investing, as you guys know, it, it isn't about outthinking anyone else. It's smart investing is about remaining diversified and rebalancing back to the original allocation, not based on somebody's forecasts because we have reams of evidence suggesting that forecasting doesn't work. And yet you turn on CNBC and there you've got somebody out there talking about where stocks are headed or where bond or gold is headed over the next year or six. And it's all crazy stuff. I, I do kind of wish that we could teach this in school is to show kids, hey, let's pick forecasters. Let's see what are the top economists saying this year. And I would like like a multi-year personal finance course where really we're starting in the eighth grade. Okay, everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch CNBC. We're going to go January 1st or whatever it is. And we're going to look at the top economists and what their forecasts are for the next year. And then 12 months from now, we're going to see how they did. And CXO Advisory has done some neat stuff on this where they've tracked gurus, you know, leading economists who claim that they would know where certain asset classes were going. And they updated that, I think, in 2017 and found you might as well ask a five-year-old. Yeah. There is a media report or a little special type thing from, I don't remember, I think it was one of the Nordic countries where they compared some professional stock picking gurus to some fashion Instagram people to, I think a bull named Gull Ross, where they <laughs> had a grid in the ground and they just let him poop in a square. <laughs> and Gull Ross actually won. So, Hey, Felix the cat won that too. Oh yeah. The, the Observer published something pretty interesting in the UK Observer and they asked a bunch of leading economists and an astronomer and a five-year-old and a cat named Felix. <laughs> and uh, I think the cat won. And the previous year it was a five-year-old. So animals are good at predicting. I future, think we should I start following what the you know where the cats poop and such. <laughs> I thought the Gull Ross example was so funny just because of the the name Gull Ross. Gull Ross wins. I'm probably butchering the name. I love it. 
What about other stuff? Gold's easy to pick on, but there are lots of things like peer-to-peer lending is a newer one that has these like crazy high returns that seem they're supposed to be safe. And, you know, investment newsletters that claim to be making these crazy returns if you follow their picks. How do you think people should process that? How should they stick to their index investing strategy when there's stuff like that being shown? Ah, oh, and then that's the hard thing, isn't it? They just really need to ignore it and understand that it's all a big giant marketing machine to extract money from them to get people to pay membership fees. So, you know, we know that when we look at all of these newsletters, they're horrific when we look long term at their results. But people will claim what they want, and there's always, there are always going to be people who are going to try to take money from your wallet and stuff it into theirs, whether that's a Ponzi scheme or whether it's a newsletter from some forecaster that figures that they've got some key to is peer to peer lending them. This is how much money we've made, and it's not realistic. And most people that get into schemes like that end up really being sorry for it later. So, how do you contrast that to solid financial advice? And what do you think about? the financial advice business in general? It's rife, as you guys know too, it's rife with conflicts of interest and that can make it really tough. Okay, you have the people that, most of the people providing financial advice. Here's the challenge for you guys. This is the hardest part of what your business is because you know I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alexander Pope's essay on criticism where he has this fabulous quote where he talks about the Pyrrhean Spring. Drinking from the Pyrrhean Spring is like drinking from the the, the spring of knowledge where shallow draughts will intoxicate the brain, but then drinking deeply will sober us again. So what I'm coming to here is that it's very easy for me or anyone else, a financial writer, to say, this is easy. Toss your financial advisor out the window, fire them, build a low-cost portfolio of index funds. To an extent... That's the shallow draughts from the Pyrrhean spring of wisdom. Because now what happens is people say, carte blanche, this is it. All financial advisors are bad. They will all sell highly costly products and they really don't do any true wealth management or financial planning. And in about 99% of the case, that's true. That's what's really hard. You walk into a typical bank here in Canada and you are going to get fleeced. You're going to be convinced to buy actively managed products by somebody that in most cases isn't even a certified financial planner. So they've taken the Canadian securities course and they've got a license to sell. I've talked to some of them and they've said three weeks, three week intensive course. And now they're selling RRSPs to Canadians. Super dangerous, right? really responsible, makes a lot of money for the banks. But here's the challenge for you guys. And you have firms that do full financial planning properly. You have firms and they're few and far between, but they'll charge, or first of all, they won't believe in forecasts. They believe in diversification. They'll put people into portfolios of low cost Vanguard iShares or DFA funds. So low cost index funds that are bounced back to the original allocation, but they'll also work with them on a completely different level, like financial or a family CFO. So I have a friend in Thailand who's a financial advisor. And what she does is she becomes part of the family. She's an extension of that family in a lot of ways. So when she has her quarterly meetings with her clients, she's asking them to go over what their spending budget is, for example. All kinds of decisions about whether we can afford this house or not. And she gives them, to the best of her ability, really objective advice. And she builds all of her clients' portfolio of index funds. She helps them with things like estate tax planning. She helps them with things like obviously tax advantaged platforms. So you'd be looking at, is it best for you at this point to put this particular money into an RRSP or a TFSA? Obviously she's in Thailand, so she's not dealing with that. She's an American who deals with expats, but you guys do something similar to that. So what I do write about in my book, Millionaire Expat, is I said, there's a lot of value in this whole wealth management process if it's done properly. But most financial advisors, I believe, are just one step short of charlatans or used car salespeople. And that's why in a position like yours, 
it's a really, really, really tricky position to be in because most people don't understand the differences. You mentioned a few and you gave an example, but can you just talk explicitly about the specific qualities that you think people should be looking for if they are going to make the decision to hire a financial advisor or a wealth manager? Yeah, certified financial planners for sure. They should have an approach whereby they don't forecast at all, ever. No decision is ever made based on what they think the markets will do or what some guru thinks the markets will deliver. They build diversified portfolios only of index funds or DFA index funds. And I think that in itself, if you've got those three components in line and they don't charge excessive fees, like more than maybe it's a retainer fee or no more than say 1.25% on total assets each year, and preferably they can lower that too as the investor's base increases, then I think these are great hurdles to be looking for. And I think once you establish these components, you will cut out about 99.562, exactly, percentage of Canadian financial advisors. Right. The point about how easy it is as a financial writer to just say fire all advisors is an interesting one. And I think one of the most interesting anecdotes about that is Dan Bortolotti, who I know you know, he used to say that in his writing. And he made the full circle transition to becoming a financial advisor. Once he, <laughs> but I think he wrote about how he learned through experience that people really, some people can do this on their own, but a lot of people really have trouble executing and staying disciplined and sticking to the plan and not using forecasts to make decisions. Yeah. And I too, when I, it was like that bringing back to that period spring of knowledge, I was there, there with Dan and Dan and I were drinking it and we're going, okay, let's have a look at this. Well, nobody needs a financial advisor. Nobody. Everybody's good to go on their own. But then I think in both cases and for different reasons, we continued to dig a little bit and to learn a bit. So I'm on a couple of Facebook forums and you know, one couple of that I'm, I'm moderating and I've got thousands of members and uh, most of them are overseas. And it's really interesting that when I post something about, hey, you know, if you have the right kind of financial advisor, not only is there the, the financial planning benefit, but statistically speaking, they can help work as a gatekeeper to stop you from doing silly things. So sure, it's pretty easy to build a portfolio of index funds, but to ensure that you don't do something silly with it over the next 30 years when markets go crazy, headlines are trying to scare the bejesus out of you every single day, and that's their job. They'll try and scare you as much as they can because fear draws more eyeballs and eyeballs draw more advertisement dollars, and it perpetuates the widespread ignorance. Now, this is the kind of thing that when I post this, I get absolutely slammed by the same communities that love my book, read my book, but have a hard time accepting that, you know what? You might not be capable of doing this on your own. What I really like looking at, guys, is the, here's an example that I've used when I've posted this as a possibility, especially for high net worth clients with all kinds of potentially complicated tax issues. But when I've said things like this, I say, look, if we take the period from 2003 to 2013, you really had two volatile periods there. You had two market volatile periods that would have tested you. And if you look at Vanguard's index fund investors, say they're S&P 500 investors, most investors with Vanguard USA are DIY investors. They're doing it on their own. Well, the returns of the index over that time period was say something like 8% a year. The average investor during that same time period average something like 5.5% a year. I mean, they underperform the market by about 2.5% per year. Wow. I hadn't heard that one. That's interesting. It's unbelievable. And what it really does show is that the average person during volatile periods cannot, as much as they might think, they cannot harness their emotions. It's much like, you know, how are you guys going to respond if you use, lose the use of your legs or if you get cancer? you can't answer that question until it's actually happened to you. I get a kick out of it when I see people that do it on their own and they, they go 100% equities. They say, well, long term is that over the last whatever, any 30, 40 year period, going 100% equities will outperform a portfolio that's more balanced. The bottom line isn't how the asset classes perform. 
perform. The bottom line is how well can you perform? Can you harness your emotions such that and what kind of portfolio would allow you to stay in the game and not end up doing something silly? And the studies do show that most investors do end up shooting themselves in the feet. It's very easy when the market's going up, but markets right. don't always go up. No, they do not. So at home, uh, I spend a lot of time helping my kids make what I think are smart decisions with their money. And I know you're a big proponent of educating younger people on investing in money. Do you have recommendations for parents about how they can do the best possible job with their kids? And, and I think, I mean, everybody's going to have a different view, I think, on this camera. But what I believe is that kids could ha should have their own skin in the game. And when I say that, I'm not a really a big proponent of parents giving their kids money to start their investment portfolio. Okay, maybe to start it. Okay, here's a little bit and we get it started. So they might have a portfolio in trust, something like that. But I think the most important thing is for the kids to understand that money doesn't grow on trees, that they have to work to earn it, and it has to be their personal money that they're adding to it. Because that does two things, I think. Obviously, it gives them a solid foundation in terms of the concept of deferring gratification, knowing that I should be saving something for the future, whether that's just a portion of their allowance or whether that's 70% of their allowance, regardless of what that is, to get them trained early on to recognize how important it is to be saving for the future and to not have money gifted to them. And I think that's one of the things that's really challenging for especially wealthy parents. Wealthy parents tell me, you know, my kid's 18, I can open an account in their name now and I want to give them $100,000. And I say things like, well, you know, have you ever seen or have you seen any of Thomas Stanley's work on economic outpatient care? And they're like, well, what does that mean? Well, when you give something to somebody, you give them money, you can actually end up weakening them because they don't build their own muscles. It's kind of like doing push-ups for your kid, hoping your kid's going to get stronger. Your kid really needs to be able to build their own financial muscles, roll up their sleeves and get that work ethic started early. At least that's my opinion. But where are you guys standing on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good way to look at it. I think it was Charlie Munger that I heard say this. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that though. But if you are wealthy and you make your kid live as if they were poor, that can cause pretty substantial problems for them because they'll feel resentment. But that doesn't mean you have to give them money it just means that their lifestyle, the child's lifestyle has to be commensurate with the family's wealth. But that's separate from giving them money to do whatever they want. Take them to Hawaii. Right. I agree with you. The data is pretty clear on what happens when, I mean, you have the example in your book of the three generations, families tend to lose any wealth. But by the third generation, families tend to lose any wealth that the first generation created. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, you look at the Forbes 400 and you think, well, okay, they must be, they must come from old money. And most of the people on the Forbes 400 are first or second generationally rich, not first, not fourth or fifth. I mean, it happens, but it's pretty rare because typically, as you say, one generation builds the wealth, the second generation maintains it, and third generation typically squanders it because they haven't acquired the tools of acquisition. Yeah. And they're extreme examples. Like I think it's the Vanderbilt family that there's been a book written about where extremely wealthy, like the wealthiest family in the United States at the time during the Gilded Age. And today, now, you can't find a wealthy Vanderbilt. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's when, you know, whenever anything comes really easily to people, whether it's an NBA basketball player who's making millions of dollars a year, and, and as we know, most of them end up filing for bankruptcy within five years of their retirement. And it's really similar for professional soccer players, professional football players in the US. And it's not too dissimilar to lottery winners. When something comes easily and quickly, it typically gets squandered. Yeah, exactly. So your second book, Millionaire Expat, is fantastic as a resource. I read through it. A lot of it didn't apply to me because I'm not an expat. I live in Canada. But it's so detailed and nuanced. For anybody that is an expat, I'm sure it's extremely useful. I can't imagine there are many other resources that are that comprehensive out there. But anyway, you're also living as an expat. 
in one of the sections of the book, you talk about the benefits of living in lower cost of living countries. So as a last question, I just wanted to ask, what do you think for Canadians who are currently working in Canada, do you think it's worth considering planning to spend part of retirement or like you're doing a big chunk of retirement in lower cost of living countries? If somebody has a tolerance for other cultures, they're curious when they go somewhere, they don't complain about why it's not the way it is at home. They're willing to embrace parts of other cultures and people in other cultures. If that jazzes them, then what many people call geographical arbitrage is a fantastic thing because you could do financial planning for somebody here in Canada and you might be able to figure out that, hey, at age, say, 65, you can retire. But at the same time, that same person might be able to retire at 59 if they spend six months a year down in Ajijic, Mexico, where the costs of living are significantly lower and the weather is significantly better. I would recommend the winter months, obviously. But I think this is a fabulous opportunity for the right type of person. Yeah. It's a big deal. Like you mentioned, the financial planning, the purely financial planning implications can be huge. Are there any, like you've lived this, so I'm asking from your personal experience, are there downsides? Like me as a Canadian who's lived his whole life in Canada and the US, I, I mean, it seems kind of scary to go live in like Mexico, for example. Are there any <laughs> downsides to doing this? If there are, I haven't seen them yet. So uh, it's something I love doing. So the last six years, I'd say, you know what, it probably what fascinated me was reading a book by a couple of writers. They write for International Living, and they wrote this book called International Living's Guide to Retiring Overseas on a Budget. And I read it, and I was fascinated by it. Now, these guys, keep in mind, International Living is a huge cheerleader for living overseas in low-cost locations. So they're not always going to be the people that are weighing up all the pros and cons. They're just going to be bombarding you with all the pros. But I have to say that when I check out places like Mexico and I see the costs, one thing that many people will ask is what about the safety? So you have the safety issue of a place like Mexico. And generally speaking, of course, the media will end up freaking us out with concepts of we're going to get kidnapped, beheaded, shot, whatever. Typically, the violence in places like Mexico is, well, in Mexico itself is cartel on cartel. They're not typically after tourists. And so a lot of these expat communities, Lake Chapala is a really great area just south of Guadalajara. My wife and I have spent several months there. And if you're getting things like dental work done, it's a fraction of what it costs in Canada. Major upside. But if you want the same kinds of things that you're used to here in Canada and you want it to be exactly the same and for the locals to think exactly the same way you think and your neighbors back at home thinks, that's a major downside. For people like that, don't go. You got to stay at home. But if your mind is flexible and you're willing to embrace these different cultures, I think most Canadians will find that they're much more open and far more beneficial, both financially, culturally, and socially than most Canadians would ever imagine. Yeah. It's really interesting to think about. I, I hadn't thought about it a ton until I read that book. The clients that we have that include this type of thing in their financial plan are generally people that are from whatever lower cost of living country they're planning to retire in. But in terms of Canadians sort of born and raised in Canada or that spent most of their life in Canada, I don't think it's something that most people think a whole lot about. Mm, yeah. And that makes sense, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Geographical arbitrage. That might be the term of the interview. <laughs> so, Andrew, my last question for you, and I'm very curious for your answer. How do you define success in your life? Ah, uh, success for me personally. And a great question because I speak to students about this a lot. And for me, I tell them that success relates to one thing and one thing only relationships your relationship with yourself and your relationship with other people. Do you have people who love and respect you? And the only way to have people love and respect you is to give love and respect. To me, that's success. 
probably not the answer you're looking for, but I know I'm right. Oh, it's a great answer. <laughs> great answer. The other stuff is all icing on the cake. You know, obviously you do need shelter. Obviously you need food in the belly. Obviously you need access to medical. Once you have all that, you have enough. And if you can have all that in perpetuity, you have enough. That's enough. And then success comes entirely from the relationships that you forge. And the only way to nurture that is to give love and respect to other people. It's an amazing answer. Andrew, it's been great to get to know you a bit and introduce you to our listeners. And we're so grateful to have you on our podcast. Thanks. It was great chatting with you guys. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thank you.